the person in charge of the state made me go tell Ted Kennedy that his brother was shot. So yeah, I remember where I was. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Esther Newberg, thank you for joining us today. Although you've been my literary agent for 30 plus years, while I was preparing for this, I realized how little I actually know about you. So thank you in advance for the chance to get to know you better. You're welcome. <laughs> You'll be sorry when you, when you find out more. But <laughs> Esther, Troy, and I like to have our guests tell their entire story. So let's go back to your childhood. What did your parents do? How many siblings do you have? I'm guessing you were a good student. Did you have any other interests? My uh, father <clears throat> owned a small um, insurance agency in Middletown, Connecticut, where Wesleyan University is. My mother was very active in politics, which is why I started out in politics after college. And my mother ran the, the, the first time a woman governor was elected in her own right. My mother was a campaign manager. And she had no college because my grandfather was a miserable SOB who wouldn't let, let her take the scholarship she had to Boston University. So she graduated high school in three years. She came out and she just, she used to love to tell me and my sister, who's 10 years older than I am, she's 91, um, that she wished she'd never had kids, that she'd gone to law school and she had run for governor herself. That's always a good thing to hear when you're a kid. <laughs> she is. And, um, and I was a mediocre student, which is why I only went to Wheaton College, um, as opposed, say, to Wellesley or something grand or Penn or... But I... Um, but I love politics and government, and that's what I majored in, and that's what I did for the first 15 years after I graduated in Washington. I heard your family had a big mansion in Newport, Rhode Island that you spent your summers at. Is that true or urban legend? So that was, you must be joking. In his best year, my father made $26,000 a year. We lived in assisted living facilities, sort of. I mean, not assisted, but um, whatever that other word is. Subsidized. Yeah. And um, my grandfather, the one that was not a good guy, and grandmother lived in Florida, but in the summers they would come up to Old Sabre, Connecticut, where in the 30s he bought a beach house that wasn't winterized. But every summer, starting on Memorial Day until Labor Day, we would go to this beach house. And my father thought it was a terrible commute from Middletown, Connecticut to Old Saybrook. It was 23 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so when my grandfather died, my grandmother left the house to my mother. And the walls were made, I think, of paper. Um, and it was not a mansion, to put it mildly. <laughs> but it was fun to have a place to go. What about high school? What are some of your favorite memories? Well, I um, 
dated the quarterback <laughs> who was really cute and he's still my friend. Um, he married the head cheerleader though, um, sadly, and not me. Um, and I, um, they voted me uh, funniest. <laughs> I was kind of hoping for most likely to succeed, but it didn't happen. <laughs> and I loved high school. Because if I wasn't a great student, my friends were really not good students. So I looked like, you know, Einstein by comparison. Um, I, I loved, I was not, there's nothing about high school that I didn't like. Except when I would walk into a class and my, my five aunts and uncles had gone to this same high school as had my sister. And the older teachers, when I would walk in the first time, would say, wow, another Newburgh. God, they were my best students. I said, well, you're in for a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had, I had some of that, Esther, when I was my older brother and older sister never got even told no, let alone a detention or anything. So when I came through, it was it was a culture shock. I met that older sister, so I, I'm, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was high school, but it was great. And it's fun to still, I still have one of the things my mother was smart enough to do. She, she died at 93. She befriended all of my friends. So she had all these younger friends who would come see her. She stayed in the house until she died. She had all these young friends. And so I've stayed friendly with my high school friends because they were they were so important to my mother over the years. It was cool. You ended up at Wheaton College. How did you choose Wheaton? What did you study? So I couldn't get in any place else because I was not a good student, as I said to you. I studied, um, I majored in government and I really liked it. And um, this was the kind of mother I had the first year I was failing economics and I called home and I was crying and I said, I have to take it at summer school. And my mother said, I only want a phone call with good news. So when people think I'm a little bit tough, they, they should only know what I came from. <laughs> <laughs> did you, uh, did you end up liking it at, at Wheaton once you were there? I did. I loved it. I loved being at an all girls school because back then, on the weekends, what you would do is seven girls would rent a, a van cab and you would drive to Dartmouth or Princeton or Wesleyan. That reminds me of a funny story I'll tell you. But you and the cab driver, you put him up in a motel for the two days and then you'd stay and then he'd drive you back. And that's how you dated back then. So. The weekend that we went to Wesleyan, I didn't have to stay in a, in, a, in a motel because, of course, I lived there. So the poor guy that I was, I was dating, <laughs> I gave him the address where I was staying. And he rings the door, and his face comes to the door that looked exactly like me, my father. And he said, oh, no, you're the father? <laughs> it was great. He was... Back, because back in the day, you thought, you know, lucky things were going to happen to you, but not when you're staying with your parents. <laughs> Sorry. Are you, did any of your friends from high school go to the same college as you? My, my, the, the guy that I was dating went to a school nearby. So we dated the, my freshman year and then, then no, but nobody else from my college, from my high school went to my college. But I have, a, I still have a lot of college friends, so the ones that are still with us. What were your aspirations when you were at college? Did you know what you wanted to do? To someday be the chief of staff in the White House. So I, I started the Young Democratic Club at Wheaton, and I was in college from 59 to 63. 
And so I just, I, I, I fed, fell head over heels for John Kennedy. And uh, one, day, one day during the campaign, I came back to my dorm room and someone had plastered Nixon stickers on every inch of my wall. And I couldn't get them off without ripping the, you know, the paint off. And, and the damn college made me um, pay for that, even though I didn't do it. <laughs> Let me say, it was really. But um, I went to Washington two months before John Kennedy was killed and had a terrible job. Like I, I, I think I was a GS three. You, you can barely get lower than that. So I was probably making forty eight hundred dollars a year, and I was alphabetizing cards for the USIA libraries around the world. I don't think I got past the ABs. It was a, it was, it was in a basement in Arlington, Virginia. You cannot. Come up, except for being a, maybe a toll taker on 95, there's no more boring job. So I called my mother, who had asked if I wanted any help, and I said, of course not. I said, I need help. I can't stand this anymore. And she got me a job working for the senator from Connecticut, whose name was Abe Ribicoff. And he was an early supporter of John Kennedy. So I worked in his office, and and through Senator Ribicoff, I met Robert Kennedy, and I worked in his Senate office, and then in his presidential campaign, till he too was assassinated. Um, and then I I worked for Congresswoman Bella Abzug, who was um, this gigantic feminist, again, and and she she was a at the forefront of every important issue of the day, feminism and uh, gay rights. And um, she wanted desperately to end the war in Vietnam. And she would constantly bring that up on the floor of the house. And everyone hated, the leadership hated that she did that. So one day we're coming up the escalator at the old house office building and coming down were the Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader. And one of them said, better luck on a vote next time, Bella. And she turned to these two men and said, you. I said, well, there goes my parking space. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't good. She was, she was an amazing person to work for. And I worked for um, Ed Muskie's presidential campaign and Mo Udall's. And I ran the Democratic Party structure in New York for three years. And then one day, I think it was during the Udall campaign, I hadn't been paid in three months and my parents had no money and they were paying my rent. And I get a call from Leslie Stahl, who's on 60 Minutes, who was one of my college pals. And she said, the agency I work for, 1976 this was, is looking for someone to represent political books and political writers. And I suggested you. I said, to be what? She said, to be an agent. I said, well, what does that even mean? Well, why don't you just go talk to them? So I did. And I walked into this beautiful office at 40 West 57th Street at the time. And there was carpeting on the floor. And they offered me $27,000, which was more than my father was making, and a health plan. I thought it was so cool, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I said, yes. <laughs> and for the first three months, I had no clients, no phone calls. There was no such thing as email, of course. But I sent out about 150 letters to every political journalist and politician and anybody I could think of, you sent out hard copies of letters. And then somebody, you know, got back to me. Esther, I know you are very close to the Kennedy family. Did that come about before or after you were on Robert Kennedy's staff? After, way after. 
way after because because I became friendly with Caroline and John. And that was through someone Caroline wrote her books with. That's how I met and became friendly with them. What was your first job and how did that eventually lead to working with Bobby Kennedy? I know you met with Bobby before you were hired. Do you recall what he said to you and how you felt? No, I'm sorry that I, remember you're talking to an 82 year old Tim and maybe I told you the story 30 years ago, but no, I met him. I met him when he worked on Senator Ribicoff's subcommittee on government reorganization. And the way I first met him, he did, he had a special mouth. He didn't like drinking coffee out of paper cups. So he would send me all the way back to his office to get a China cup. He was, he was bratty that way. He couldn't help it. That's how he was raised. Kind of like you thinking I had a mansion in Newport. Well, they did. So that's how I met him. And one day I told Senator Ribicoff I was going to work for for Robert Kennedy, and he was really mad. So that that was not a good day for me. But I I loved working for him. I loved it. Why was he so mad? Just because you were leaving, or yes, yeah, and because my mother had called and made a big deal out of getting me a job, and it looked like I was not grateful. What what made you decide to to leave and to go with uh, Robert Kennedy? He was so young and so cool. I mean, you can't even remember. Obviously, Troy, you can't remember, and Tim is too young to remember, probably. But he was, he was. Um, you know, after his brother died, he he was a very shy personality, um, and he had to kind of transform himself in order to run for office and but he did but he we went to a migrant labor camp in up near Rochester once and he saw these kids in those terrible living conditions and he cried I mean he was a he was a he really had real feelings there none of this fake political stuff with him and which is why everybody was so dedicated to him and why his stupid son should not be running for office using his name. (laughs) Why do you say that? Because he is stupid because he doesn't believe in (laughs) vaccines of any kind. Oh my God. (laughs) His whole family is against him. You were in charge of upstate New York. What was that like? Well, so my my title was um, executive director of the Democratic State Committee, <laughs> and the 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 uh, chairman at the time was being watched by the FBI, and he eventually went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, he wouldn't give me a raise, and I was making nothing. And he he said, "I'll tell you what, I'll give you some money off the books." <laughs> and I said, "I don't want that kind of money." I want a real raise. Well, just so you know, um, the FBI was taping his office. And later on, after he went to jail, one of the guys called me and said, you would have been right behind him if you'd taken that money from him. Because we we have it on tape and we have your outrage on tape, too. (laughs) But so I had to talk to all of these Democratic chairman and all those Plattsburgh like places. And, um, you know, it was fun, sort of. What what was the best part? Seeing the whole state, you know, sometimes you can come to New York and not have a clue what anything else is, so. Then you were asked to serve on the Senator's presidential campaign. Many people didn't see this coming, but you made a bet with a friend that it would happen. And you don't normally bet, do you? Well, that was then. I, I just, I, for my nephew's birthday, two weeks ago, we were at the Connecticut Casino 
And on Saturday night, we lost at the craft table, but on Sunday morning, we won. <laughs> <laughs> so I do bet now a little bit. I, I like that craft table. It's fun. Um, Robert Kennedy didn't want to run for president. If you remember, he, uh, Gene McCarthy was running and he was so depressed when he got into the race and all the young people were from McCarthy. He couldn't understand it because he thought he was a favorite of young people, but he had waited so long. Um, it, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened because he won Oregon and he won California. But before that, he hadn't won states. And so who knows if he could have pulled it off. I don't know that. Maybe not. But he was um, something special. Could you tell us about the Boiler Room Girls and the history of the Boiler Room? Not really. Never talked about it. Never going to. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, we were, we were called that because we were, we, we each had several states that we monitored during the campaign and we collected all the data and we would give it at the end of the day to whoever was in charge of the state. So that's why we're, I don't know why that term, but it was sort of like a hot mess. So they called it the boiler room which is not why you asked me the question, but I'm not answering that part. Why are you, I'm, I'm curious why you don't want to talk about it. Is it because everybody asks you or because it's a... Because none of us ever have. And um, I, I think that, that, that people, people should res respect um, I mean, there the the press were like vultures after that happened. And, and I just didn't want to give anybody the satisfaction of, of, um, you know, exacerbating what was already a horrible situation since, since a friend had died. I mean, I just, it wasn't anybody's business, I thought. So I, so none of us ever talked about it. Okay. We can move on. Esther, I know you must have been disgusted with the gender discrimination back then. I certainly was. And I wish we'd had a Me Too movement back then, let me tell you. I just did a book with a woman. It's, it's um, where is it? Um, it's a oral history of the women's movement from 1963 until 1970 something. And she captures the voices of everybody that's still around. And um, it was really hard. I mean, one of the reasons I like working for Congressman Udall for president was that all of the major people in his campaign at a high level were women. He was gender blind and he, he was really funny. Um, he was a six foot seven or eight semi-pro basketball player with one eye. And then he ran for Congress in, in uh, Arizona. And people like John Kennedy used to call him for jokes because that's how funny he was. And maybe, maybe the fourth book I did after I became an agent was a humor book by Udall. He was a great guy. Esther, do you remember where you were when you got the news that Senator Kennedy had been assassinated? And can you tell us what you were thinking? That must have been really tough. So I was in Detroit because they let the boiler room girls go to the, some of the states that they were covering. And so I, I was in Detroit that night. And the, uh, the person who was running the state was a very sentimental um, Irishman and um, he got the phone call and Ted Kennedy was in Detroit. K 
campaigning for his brother that night. And the, the, um, the, the person in charge of the state, who was from um, Buffalo, uh, made me go tell Ted Kennedy that his brother was shot. So, so yeah, I remember where I was. What was that like, telling the brother? You know, he was very stoic. He, um, he said, I need a plane, I need to get to L.A., and, you know, can, can you all arrange that? And I, I couldn't believe how together he was because the, the, the guy from Buffalo, the Democratic chairman, was, uh, was in his room sobbing because this was unexpected. Obviously horrible, but but you know that's why um, they, they, they just so much has happened to them. That must have been one of the lowest parts of your life, Esther. I know that you are Jewish, but I don't know how religious you are. Let me tell you why I'm asking the question I'm about to ask. As you know from my unpublished memoir, I had a religious epiphany not long after my diagnosis. I have been blessed more than I deserve in this life but I was little more than a Christian in name only. I wasn't living it. Anyways, now I try. Did your Jewish faith or some personal philosophy help you make sense of the low points in your life? No. I wish I could say that. I've always envied, well, not envied, but I, I've had respect for Caroline Kennedy's religious beliefs because it's comforted her because she's had to go through a father being killed, a mother dying young, a brother's plane crashing, and now this. I mean, I was raised as a conservative Jew. My great-grandfather founded the synagogue in Connecticut, and we observed the holidays, but my mother didn't keep a kosher house and religion just, I, it just, it's, it's escaped me somehow. Um, I'm just a black hearted agent. <laughs> I wish I, I envy people who, I don't know how to get there, but I envy people who, who have it. Looking at Donald Trump on television, I can't believe how anyone can believe in God, I got to tell you. I'd like him to spend one night in jail because he's such a germaphobe that if he had to use that, that open toilet, he'd have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> yeah. What did you do for work after Senator Kennedy's death? For one year, I worked at a place called the Urban Institute that does research. It was... I used to close my door and go to sleep on the desk. It was so boring. And then one day I got a, um, I got a call from, from um, the Democratic State Committee people. And I took that job for four years. And then I worked for Bella and then I became an agent. And so I've been an agent for 48 years. I tell kids that they don't have to have a real life or career until they're 35 because because I had two and you don't have to. After a year, the Boiler Room Girls had a reunion on Chappaquiddick Island that ended in tragedy when a car being driven by the youngest of the Kennedy brothers, also a United States Senator, Teddy, went off a bridge and the young woman with him drowned. Can you tell us the story from the bystander's perspective and the impact it had on Teddy's career? No, I, I can't really. I, I just don't talk about it. And uh, the impact on his career, I think he just wasn't a great candidate. You might remember when he was asked why he was running for president. He couldn't give a good answer. He was a great senator. But he, he was running for president because he thought he should, that another Kennedy should run, and he just wasn't up to it. And after, after Robert Kennedy died, he, he was a mess. And I, I would see him at some things, and he was just, he was a mess. 
So he, he ran because he thought he, he should. Um, but, uh, but I don't talk about Chappaquiddick. And um, as much as I love you, and look how handsome you still look, which is quite something, I'm not telling you. <laughs> so there. When did you decide to leave politics and go be a literary agent in New York City? Or were you an editor first? Either way, who was your first client? My first client was a reporter for an Arizona newspaper. His name was Don Bowles. And he was writing investigative stuff about the mafia. And I sold his book, not for very much money. We never met in person. But before he got any money even on the book, one day he opened his car door and the car blew up. Yeah, that was my first client. That must did that scare you as the agent? No, not as the agent, but it, but it was, it was amazing, unbelievable story, right? Mm. Who was your first big client where you said to yourself, "I could really make a living doing this"? That's a good question. Um, I think it was, um, even though the, the book sucked, it was uh, Geraldine Ferraro, after she ran for vice president, I got called to Washington to interview with like seven other agents. And I knew that they had hired me at my company to do political books, so I better get her. So I just, I, I was torturing myself. How do I get her? And blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I got her. And it was my first book I sold for a million dollars. The book didn't sell any copies because she didn't have so much to say. But it was, I knew then that it was, a, it was the right thing to do. That was a lot of money back then. Once you got the first big client, did things kind of snowball like in, the, in, that, in the world that you're in? I wouldn't say snowball. I would say snowflake. It was a little, it, it, it was not as, but then, then in the, um, in the middle eighties, it, it, it started to, to be a good thing. Yeah. What, what happened that in the middle eighties that, uh, changed, do you think? Um, around that time I was representing, I, I got uh, Tom Friedman as a client at the times and Maureen Dowd and Frank Rich and, um, and then I just came from this, um, this thriller conference here in New York today. And on the panel was John Stanford, who's one of my earlier clients. We've done, we figured out today that we've done 61 books together. Wow. And 35 of those books have prey in the title. That's the series that he's written. And, He's hugely successful, and uh, he had been a journalist, and he realized that he had to send his kids to college, and he needed to make a living, so he sent me a couple of novels that didn't work, and I told him to keep trying, and then one day, he sent me a book that that I sold, and um, it, it, it was life-changing for both of us, because he his books have, every time he's published, his book goes to number one. That's a hard thing because a lot of people don't know his name like they know John Grisham's name, for instance. Mm -hmm. But his fans are hardcore. And so the, you know, the 90,000 people who buy his book buy it early. And buying it early means you get on the list. So um, it's not his real name. He, he had a, his real name is Camp, John Camp, and he was a journalist. But he, um, his first book was a journalism book and he decided he needed a pen name. And so it's sort of, it's sort of weird that so many people know him by his real name, but, but many more people know him by that pen name. You have represented some of the most famous authors 
and celebrities in the literary world. A few of the authors I heard you also represent are Philip Roth, Salman Rushdie, and George Saunders, and some celebrities like Prince, Tom Hanks, and Michael Jordan. But who are a few names that you are the proudest to have represented, aside from me, of course? I can't think of anyone aside from you, but I don't represent Salman Rushdie. I didn't represent Philip Roth. Um, I was proud to represent Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And, um, and I always liked the people who were funny, like Dan Jenkins was a funny. And now I represent his daughter, Sally Jenkins, who writes a sports column at the Washington Post. Um, she is a, she's as funny as her father was. Um, uh, but I loved, I loved representing Prince's book. He died before the book came out, which was a horrible thing. But um, he was, uh, I brought three editors out to meet him at the same time on the same day because I knew he would never meet them separately. And one was a guy who was 6'4 and white. One was a woman who was also taller than he was and was white. And one was Jay-Z's editor, who was a, a medium height black guy. So I knew immediately who he would pick. <laughs> he didn't like people towering over him. Um, when he died, I asked his estate if I could have the shoes that he was wearing the day I met him. They were they had kind of a heel and they were um, there was a purple ball in the heel that was blinking. And the rest of the shoe was, was a uh, see-through color. I mean, he was over the top. It was great. And they couldn't find those shoes, sadly. <laughs> uh, he was, um, he was so talented. My God. He had a contract that said, even after the book was published, if he didn't like it, he could buy it back. We've never gotten that clause for anybody. And most people wouldn't want that clause. But he, he, was, he did. He was very private and different. And he's, I brought another young agent with me who was very, very into music and while we were sitting there and all talking, he must have realized something. And he said, you're not a fan of my music, are you? I said, well, I love Purple Rain. He said, who is your favorite? I said, with my head down, I said, Bruce Springsteen. He said, oh, that's why you brought this other guy, because he's a fan of mine. I said, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he liked that I was honest. I became a fan after that, though. I remember when you read an entire 350 page manuscript of mine and you said that it wouldn't work. Now, this was book number five for me, so I wasn't some rookie. I asked you, what can I do to fix it? You said nothing. It doesn't work. Start over. So I did. I threw it away and started over. I've always wanted to ask you if I'm the only author you had that you had to be so brutally blunt with about a manuscript. No. And it, it came up this morning at this thriller panel for, with John Sanford, who, as I told you, has number one books every time he, it comes out. He sent me a book that was, that just didn't work. And his editor and I both told him, you can't, this can't be published. And he, there's a little pushback. But then he put it, he put it in a drawer and it's happened a few times. Absolutely. It, and it's a horrible thing to have to say to somebody, by the way. Can you tell, Astro, when you're reading a book, can you tell right away or do you need to finish it before you can really give a assessment of if it'll work? I have to read about 100 pages. I mean, 
some books don't work in the beginning. An editor today said to me, sometimes you should start the book with chapter three because you're sort of just warming up on the first two chapters and, and sometimes a thing like that happens. So you, you can't really tell unless the person cannot write. But someone like Tim or John, who you knew could write, you had to tell them the truth as you saw it or, you know, then, then what are you being paid for? Esther, what are your feelings about Israel and what's going on over there? I know that you have a book club for kids this summer that confronts issues like racism, gender identity, and genocide. So I was curious about your definition of genocide and your thoughts on the whole thing. Well, after I kill Trump, I'd like to kill Bibi Netanyahu because he's doing what he's doing to stay out of jail. I think... I think that the um, I think that October seventh was a brutal, unnecessary day. But I but but I think BB continuously bombing Gaza is wrong. That people are starving to death and little kids are dying. But there should have been a second state by now and. I'm afraid that unless an Arab country or two gets involved, there won't be. Um, I blame the British in part for not pushing Jordan back in the day to work with the soon to be announced Israeli state to try to convince the Palestinians to have a, a second state. In part, they feel that it's just theirs. And, you know, going back to Jesus, Jews feel it's theirs, but they have to split it. And Netanyahu has to go because what he's doing now is genocide. I know that your nephews and nieces are like your very own kids. Would you like to brag about them a little? <laughs> um, I would. So... Um, my niece's husband, who was 16 years older than she was, um, died when he was 60. So I sent um, five of them to college. And two went to Princeton, and one went to Vanderbilt, and one went to Syracuse, because we saw you. One went to um, Lehigh. Anyway, they... They all have wonderful jobs. My niece went on to Harvard Law School, and she's clerking for a federal judge. Um, my oldest great-nephew is the one with two, two children, so making me the great-great-aunt. And they're um, smart, funny, and caring. Uh, one of them is a miserable slob and stayed in my apartment recently, and I told him never to call again because the apartment looked like some hotel room that a kid trashed, and he's 34 years old. <laughs> but, you know, some people can't change. One is a screenwriter, and as all the rest of them know, so when you're an aunt, you can say, you have a favorite. You can't say that with your kids, but you can say that when you're an aunt. And the screenwriter one is my favorite because he's the funniest. And he lives in L.A. And his boyfriend was the uh, press secretary to the secretary of state. So they're on two different coasts, but they commute. That's quite a commute. But I, I, I. Yeah, so I'm, I'm lucky because they're great kids. And it turns out that four of them now live in New York, which I never expected. Um, so that's even better. Yeah, what a bonus. As for the last question, I always ask people is, um, the goal of the podcast is, you know, to have interesting conversations with interesting people and all different backgrounds. And um, so I'll ask you the same question I ask everybody else. Who are one or two people that you know that you think uh, we should have on the podcast to tell their story? 
I think you should have um, Carl Hyacin because he's very funny. He's a very funny writer, and um, it's an interesting life he's had. He he deeply believes in in um, in in the fact that Florida is being ruined by builders, and his life was threatened when he was a journalist at the Miami Herald because he would take on all the interests like the sugar people and the 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 the, um, the people who were overbuilding. And his books have that underlying edge, even though they're funny. He's criticizing people that are ruining his state. So I would have him on. And who else would I have on? I'm trying to think. Um, maybe Leslie Stahl. It's got quite, I mean, there, you know, it's a long run to be on television. And I can give you both emails if you like. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll follow up with you after. Good. Well, Troy, it's lovely to see how adorable you turned out. <laughs> and Thank Tim, you. I like all that gray hair. It's very flattering. And I like the beard, too. Cool. Esther, thank you so much for your time today. You've led an incredible life with many more chapters to come. You have a reputation not only as the most powerful agent in the literary world, but the toughest. But I will always love you for the kindness you have shown me. Well, guess what? I love you more. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Thanks so Stay. much, Esther. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Corps for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.